Yellowstone is a high uplifted plateau that sits atop a big volcanic hotspot. That's the reason why we have all these amazing geothermal features. Getting to hear wolves howl is a really special thing that our visitors get very excited about. There's a whole culture around wolf watching. My name is Kara McGarry. I am the owner of In Our Nature Guiding Services. I worked in conservation ecology and wildlife biology for about 12 years before becoming a guide in 2014 in Yellowstone. So this is kind of an extension of my field biology, but I get to do it with visitors instead of by myself or just with, with other field workers. I worked mostly in the Western U.S., but I also spent six years working in Western Australia, and I've worked in Papua New Guinea and in Antarctica as well. So I have a pretty interesting career history. It's been really fun, and I have a traveling problem like many. So I have actually been to all seven continents at least twice. So it's been really fun to develop that worldwide experience and then also develop a lot of local expertise here in Yellowstone over the past, what's that? that been seven years or so. I have an excellent team that I work with. We operate year round in Yellowstone National Park, and we're really focused on creating personalized educational and fun trips for visitors from all over the world, while we are also committing to sustainability and a respectful way of life in our wild and fragile ecosystem here in Yellowstone. We are a team of local biologists and naturalists, and we offer unique, incredible tours of Yellowstone, everything from wildlife watching trips, day hikes, multi-day backpacking trips, geology tours, cross-country skiing, and snowshoeing trips as well as night sky tours. So this is my awesome team. Angela in the right is our night sky guide. Susie with the llama is our planner. And also she guides llama treks in the summer. Claire in the bottom right there, she's a biologist guide and she is currently volunteering on Yellowstone's Wolf Project this month. Nancy is our lead naturalist guide and she has the most extensive wealth of knowledge about Yellowstone's geothermal features. Cody is a fly fishing guide in the summer and is our snowshoeing and cross-country ski guide in the winter. And then there's me again. And I kind of dabble in all of the above. So really fun folks. And we're really proud to say that we have a good travel seal certification and sustainability on our business as well. I want to tell you about Yellowstone and give you kind of an overview of the place in case it's unfamiliar to any of you. Some of it will be things you know about. Some of it might be things that hopefully surprise you. And we're going to talk about how to observe wildlife here. Some of these principles might apply to wherever you are watching wildlife, when and how to experience Yellowstone. And then we'll go into gear and logistics and some questions and answers at the end. For those of you who don't know, Yellowstone is is right in the middle of the Rocky Mountains. So we kind of have the Rocky Mountains going from the British Columbia, Alberta border up in Canada and going all the way down through Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado. Most of Yellowstone sits right inside of Wyoming, but we have a sliver in Montana and a little bit in Idaho as well. The National Park was actually established just a few days over 150 years ago, March 1st, 1872 by Ulysses S. Grant. And the park's establishment, it predates statehood of Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. It's a pretty big park. It's 2.2 million acres. It is a UNESCO World Heritage Area, and it's home to a lot of geothermal features, a lot of hydrothermal features, I should say, more than half of the world's geysers. It has almost 200 miles of road and over 900 miles of trail, so there's certainly a lot to explore here. And Yellowstone also hosts 400 animal species. Just to go into a few of the locations that we're going to talk about today, I mentioned that we're based in Gardner, Montana. It is a tiny little village at the north entrance to Yellowstone. A lot of people visit Yellowstone from either the town of West Yellowstone on the west entrance or down in Jackson Hole. Gardner is actually a much better place to be because you're right on the boundary of the park and it's not nearly as crowded or as busy. It's a little bit more of an authentic western town. In the winter we only have about 800 people. In the summer we probably have about 2,000, 2,500 people living here and we have over a million visitors that come through. So we stay busy in the summer. But Gardner is the best place to access some of our more wildlife rich habitats in places like Lamar Valley. It's a great place to access any of Northern Yellowstone, Hayden Valley, which is another wildlife rich area. And then I put the location of Old Faithful on there too, just to kind of show you how, how things are arranged.
To go into a little bit more about Yellowstone, how it got its name, it is named after the Yellowstone River that flows through it. That river is about 670 miles long, and it's one of the last undammed wild rivers in the U.S. It flows mostly north from its source. It goes up to the Missouri River and then over to the Mississippi and eventually to the Atlantic. And a lot of people think that the Yellowstone River got its name from the beautiful rhyolite rocks, these kind of yellow and pink rocks in the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone that's very iconic and famous. It actually didn't. The name is from the Minotauri indigenous people who live in eastern Montana. And French fur trappers were asking them what the name of this river was. And they referred to it as Mitsi Adazi, which means the Yellow Rock River. And they named it after these yellow sandstone rocks that were in their area. The French fur trappers translated that to Rochun, and then in English, we changed that to Yellowstone. So it's a very recycled name. The Yellowstone Canyon was really important for Yellowstone becoming a national park, though. This painting is by Thomas Moran. He painted it during the 1872 Hayden Expedition. And that was a body of work that went to Congress as they were considering this area for some kind of preservation. It was very controversial because at that time, you know, most land was being allocated to, to settlers. It was a big westward expansion. And so what won over the, the thoughts of the majority of Congress members at the time was that this place was really unique. People actually thought that Thomas Moran had fibbed about the colors on the canyon. And he said, no, no, it's even more spectacular than what I can capture in art. And there's a picture of it with the, with a rainbow, what it actually looks like. So that's kind of how Yellowstone came to be. And we talk a lot about this from the sort of political perspective and the American perspective, but Yellowstone is nothing new. There have been people living here for at least 11,000 years, indigenous people. And we have 27 different federally recognized tribes that have a long-standing relationship with Yellowstone. They actually called it by a lot of different names. And the Absoluki people, who are known to most of us as Crow, they actually refer to this area as the Land of Steam. So this is a traditional homeland for a lot of different people, Blackfeet, Shoshone, Salish, Kootenai, Ponderé, Nez Perce, and Northern Cheyenne. The sheep eater Shoshone were the only known group who lived in what is now the park year round. And they had some really amazing technologies that enable them to do that. So this picture is kind of special to me. This is the Roosevelt Arch right in Gardner. We do often have elk in our town. It's a pretty wild little frontier town right on the border of the park. And this year with all the 150th anniversary celebrations, we have a lot of inclusion of our associated indigenous tribes and we're really excited to get to have them here and be learning so much from them. Going into Yellowstone, more what you're familiar with probably is Old Faithful and the Grand Prismatic Spring. A lot of folks don't realize that Yellowstone actually is a, is a high uplifted plateau that sits atop a big volcanic hotspot. And that's the reason why we have all these amazing geothermal features. We had volcanic eruptions in Yellowstone from a very deep magma hotspot. Those eruptions were about 2.1, 1.2, and 630,000 years ago. The latest one, when that volcanic eruption happened, instead of creating a, a caldera like you would see at, say, Mount St. Helens or, or a crater lake that we're more familiar with, where you have kind of a mountain with this crater on the top, it just kind of sunk in on itself. And so it's this very subtle plateau. You wouldn't actually come here and recognize it as a caldera, but that is the approximate boundary there, that thicker dotted line. And it's about 30 by 45 miles wide. It is absolutely huge. There's not much going on in that magma chamber right now. Most of it's solid. Very little of it is liquefied. So this place is not going to blow up anytime soon. But what the heat from that magma chamber does, it gives us all these different hydrothermal features. So it heats groundwater that gets pushed up through the softer rocks and the cracks in the, in the surface of the land. 
and it gives us all these different geothermal basins. So up at Mammoth, the water is coming through, and Mammoth, I should say, Mammoth Hot Springs Terraces, that's what this picture is of. That hot water is getting driven through an ancient limestone layer from the old inland sea that we had here, and it's pushing calcium up to the surface, and then as the water cools, when it reaches the air, it drops that calcium back out, and it gives us these amazing terraces. In other places, the geothermal features are more silica-based, and that gives us geysers. So silica is a really hard rock. So we get these constrictions in the cracks and fissures. And I kind of think of it as plumbing of the hydrothermal features. And that allows pressure to build up. That water just keeps getting hotter and hotter and hotter until it eventually blows up spectacularly through the ground. We really are a land of kind of fire and there's a lot of glaciation over the place. So we've got the ice component as well. Just a lot going on here. When we're visiting geothermal features, you know, there's over 10,000 of them. I haven't actually visited every single one. We have over 500 geysers. And what happens with these systems is they're always evolving they're changing over time. So you have systems that are dry, driving up, you have systems that are that are cooling off and, and kind of senescing. And so as you're exploring in Yellowstone, you always want to be careful where you're putting your feet. We have boardwalks around the more established, well-known features, but sometimes when we're in the backcountry, it's not apparent what is geothermal and what is not. So I just recommend to people that we never go where plants don't grow. But it is really cool, admittedly, to get to go to a backcountry geothermal basin because you'll be hiking through lodgepole pine forests like this. This dominates a lot of Yellowstone. This is kind of what we see a lot, especially in the, in the central plateau of the park. And then you might start to smell some smells, some of those familiar sulfur smells where you're like, well, what is that? It's not always the most pleasant smell. But then we come out of the woods somewhere and we come across these beautiful backcountry geothermal features. And there's something even more special about that. Hopefully you were able to hear some of that sputtering and gurgling of the water. It's really, really cool. We hope that you'll get to come out here and experience that. But the other thing that Yellowstone is very well known for is its abundance of wildlife. Let's talk a little bit more about that aspect of the place. Yellowstone, it's smack dab in the middle of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So while the national park itself is 2.2 million acres, it's inside of this envelope of about 12 million acres of the most intact temperate ecosystem in the world. There are some large areas of land in Canada and Alaska that are probably more intact and bigger area, but especially for us in the lower 48, this is a really special and unique thing. And this vast area gives space for animals to exist, especially those that need a lot of land to make a living on. So if it was just Yellowstone, it would be a lot harder for wide ranging species like wolverines and wolves and grizzlies to be able to survive. So they have all this additional habitat on the outside as well. So what that does is it gives us the ability to host over 300 species of birds, 67 mammals, 16 fish, 11 species of reptiles and amphibians, and we have 1160 plants with three of those being endemic to Yellowstone. So they're found nowhere else on earth. And I just want to introduce you to a couple of the places that we have particularly high success finding wildlife in. Hayden Valley is kind of in central Yellowstone. It's to the south of the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. It's a pretty high valley and high elevation valley, I should say. The Yellowstone River flows right through the middle of it. It's, it's very meandering. It's a great place to see water birds, things like trumpeter swans and great blue herons. We have a lot of bald eagles in this valley. We also have pretty high success rate for seeing grizzly bears and wolves here. Sometimes we get great gray owls on the edges of this valley valley in the forest as well as some nice old forest. The other place that we spend a lot of time is Lamar Valley. And both of these valleys are home to herds of bison. We actually just have two herds. We have the Hayden Valley herd and the Lamar Valley herd. Both of these valleys support bison and they are the reason actually that there's a lot of grass growing in these valleys. Yellowstone right now has a bison population of between about 5,000 and 5,500. So when you visit these valleys, that's going to be the animal that you probably see the most of. There's a lot else going on. In this picture alone, the things that you can't see that I saw in this morning, 
were some grizzlies on those high meadows on the slopes. We had some wolves feeding on a carcass down in along the river. We had some elk, we had pronghorn, and we had a, a bald eagle fly over us. So there's a lot happening in these valleys, but they're really vast. I'm going to go through some of the species that we see there in the park. We've got both grizzly bears and black bears. The black bears are more forest associated typically and grizzlies tend to be out in the open in the plains a little bit more. Grizzlies tend to be more active at dawn and dusk as well. They don't like our hot weather during the summertime. So we do our trips when we go out to look at wildlife. We start about a half an hour before dawn so that we can make sure that we're out in the cool of the day to maximize our likelihood of seeing these animals. One of the things that confuses a lot of our visitors is the name black bear, because as it turns out, especially in the Western United States, a lot of our black bears are not black. So this is a, a mother black bear and her, what we call a cinnamon colored cub. And they're just having a good time playing in the snow. So when you see bears, you can't tell what species they are just based on what they look like or what color they are. What we go off of is actually their body shape, their overall physique. So grizzly bears have this hump on their shoulders. So we say if, if the bear has a hump that is higher than its rump, we know it's a grizzly. And grizzlies can be anywhere from blonde to a really dark chocolate brown, they look black in some lights, and likewise black bears can be anywhere from blonde to black as well. So don't go off of color. Look for the hump. We have three canines in Yellowstone. We have red fox, coyotes, and wolves. They're all different sizes, foxes obviously being the smallest, and wolves being between about 100 and 120 pounds on average. Coyotes are kind of medium size, 30 to 40 pounds. Our coyotes are spectacularly beautiful. And especially on our big, vast landscapes, it can kind of be hard to tell size and scale sometimes. So a lot of visitors get fooled into thinking they're seeing a wolf when they're seeing a coyote. And the way that coyotes interact with wolves and vice versa is really, really interesting. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but they have a somewhat adversarial role with each other. Coyotes in general try to avoid wolves unless wolves are coming near their territories where they have their young, especially in the spring and summer, in which case they will harass wolves. And you start to see some of the unique dispositions of specific wolves and specific coyotes because some wolves are quite tolerant of coyotes and some wolves are definitely not. So there's conflict that happens there sometimes. We have eight hooved animals in Yellowstone. We call those ungulates. It's a fun new word. These are elk, bison, moose, mule deer, white-tailed deer, bighorn sheep, mountain goat, and pronghorn. Our elk are very abundant where I live up in Gardner. They're not abundant everywhere in Yellowstone, but if you're visiting and you wish to see elk, I cannot recommend Mammoth area highly enough because it's just the elk mecca. In fact, the, the Absolute Crow people actually called the Yellowstone River the Elk River because it's really good elk habitat. And if you happen to be in Yellowstone in May or June, you're going to be able to see these tiny little, little elk calves getting around the place. They tend to be out a lot more in the morning than in the heat of the day. So that's a special treat. Our bison that I mentioned earlier, they're, they're quite abundant now, but if you were in Yellowstone in the late 1880s, you would not see bison. They were made nearly extinct by westward expansion of colonists and extermination in an effort to subdue the Plains tribes. And by the late 1880s, we had no bison known in the wild anywhere in the United States. And we had a few hundred in captivity. And luckily, some small herd of bison was found in a remote area of Yellowstone down near Yellowstone Lake, said to be fewer than two dozen. And we actually have a beautiful history of bison restoration in Lamar Valley where those last remaining bison were brought into what was built as the Lamar Buffalo Ranch. It's a group of log buildings and corrals that date back to 1903. And these bison were brought there. They're put in the corrals and protected from poachers. Other bison that were purebred were brought in from captivity and this breeding program began. And so that's why we now have all these wild bison in Yellowstone. And a lot of the wild bison throughout the U.S. descend from the same group. So we're really lucky to have them. If you are in Yellowstone in the summer, especially late July and August, you're going to see bison in their breeding season. And their behavior is really fascinating. We'll talk a little bit more about that later when we're going through the seasons, but they're such a great animal to watch. Their behavior is fascinating. If you're in the fall, you're probably going to see bighorn sheep in rut. So that's their breeding time. 
The males fight pretty aggressively. Sometimes when they hit their heads against each other, it sounds like a firecracker or something is going. So they're really incredible to watch. They're so athletic and they're on very, very steep slopes often. So that's the treat that time of year. We do see these animals all year round, but their behavior gets the most interesting in sort of October and November. Moose we have as well. They are less common to see in Northern Yellowstone in the summertime, but winter is a fabulous time to see them, especially early winter while we have them coming down to lower elevation to spend time in the valleys and feed on the willows and they still have their antlers they drop their antlers usually sometime between christmas and mid-january and then they start to regrow them for the next year so if you're interested in seeing moose in yellowstone that's a good time to come by far our weirdest hooved animal in yellowstone and i would say just one of the weirdest animals i've ever encountered is pronghorn a lot of people call these antelope they are not antelope they're not related to antelope uh, they do look similar to African antelope, but they're really distinct. They're in their own family. So they're not related to sheep. They're not related to deer, any of those. They're actually closest living relative is the giraffe. So they're very, very distinct. They're a holdover from the Pleistocene. And they're also the fastest North American land animal. They can run up to 60 miles per hour. And their breeding season is, it kind of corresponds with the bison around August, but these animals are much more polite and eloquent about the way that they go about attracting a mate. The males have a distinct territory that they defend from other males. That's what's going on here. And usually they don't fight head to head like this. They do a lot more chasing of each other, but they'll have their little territory and groups of females will travel around in the valleys and, and kind of check out the different male territories and, and sort of check in and the male will pay a lot of attention to them, but they're just, you know, they're just shopping around. And then when they decide what male territory they're particularly impressed with, they'll go back and mate with him. All of this being said about these animals and an introduction to who is here, you might be wondering why you would want to go with a guide and what's the point of having a guide if there's all these animals just on the landscape. I can tell you that you'll definitely see bison if you come to Yellowstone and you don't have a guide and you'll probably get lucky and see a few others. But one of the things that we have as guides is we have really amazing equipment. Specifically, we use Swarovski and Vortex spotting scopes, which are the highest quality optics. And what this does is it enables you to see animals living their lives from a distance where you are not a concern of theirs. So your presence is not impacting their behavior. This is a really, really respectful way to observe wildlife. And it also gives us insight into their lives that I actually find is much more interesting than, you know, seeing a coyote cross the road and, and look at me or coming across something in, in that kind of closer proximity where the animals showing distinct behavioral changes based on my presence or where I'm trying to look at them through binoculars, but they're so far away that I'm not really getting the hang of some of those finer details. With spotting scopes, we can really, really zoom in, really check things out. This would be, for those of you who are photographers, the equivalent to looking through about a 2,000 to 3,000 millimeter lens. So we use sturdy tripods so that we really have that image stability as we're watching animals. We do use binoculars too. A lot of times we get animals in kind of that medium distance or when we're looking at birds, binoculars can be really helpful for finding things. The scopes are really helpful for watching. And we also have skills for finding things. So we know what habitats animals tend to be found in. So if you tell me, hey, Kara, you know, I'd really like to see some golden eagles. I'm going to know where I've seen golden eagles, where they nest, what they tend to be up to at this time of year. So that's not to say that I'm going to be able to 100% know where they're going to be, but I'm going to know the best places to look for them. And so we strongly increase your likelihood of seeing the things that you want to see. And we also are always listening to the birds around us. We're listening to ravens and bald eagles. They have specific calls that they make that indicate the presence of maybe a carcass, or they might alarm at certain other animals like bears or wolves. And so we're always listening for those sounds. Coyotes have a particularly distinct alarm bark that they use when wolves are around. And so we listen out for those because that can really help us focus our efforts in searching for animals and finding the kinds of things that we want to find. Finding a carcass is always a big deal because carcasses bring in a lot of different animals and a lot of different behaviors as they vie for an opportunity to feed on that. This is a radio collared wolf. 
Yellowstone has a lot of different wildlife studies going on and radio telemetry is used for a lot of the animals to be able to track where they're traveling and what kinds of habitats and resources they're using and even how they're interacting with each other over vast landscape. One of our guides named Claire is actually working on Yellowstone's wolf research project right now. And generally when we're out in the park, we're, we're talking to researchers pretty often to keep track of what's going on. We share a lot of information. If we see something on one of their collared animals, we'll let them know. So it's pretty cool. We get to engage in a bit of citizen science. These opportunities are so special to get to work together. We have a very community feel in Yellowstone. And also by having these radio collars and things on animals, it gives us somewhat of an ability to find out what individuals we're looking at, and we get to learn about specific attributes. That's a lot about animals that we will see. I'm going to talk about some animals that we probably will not see when you visit Yellowstone. We have three species of felines or cats. We have mountain lions, bobcats, and lynx all three North American cat species. We rarely see these. I have seen lynx tracks and bobcat tracks, but I have not yet seen them living in Yellowstone. I have seen a few mountain lions. We usually see them in the wintertime, and that's a really special thing when I get to share those sightings with clients, even if the mountain lion's super far away. But we don't tend to see them very often. And I have also, likewise, this animal in the lower left is a wolverine. I've never seen a wolverine. I really look forward to doing it at some stage. I've never seen one in Yellowstone or anywhere else. But we did actually have a wolverine sighting on March 5th. One of my colleagues got to see it and it was a big deal. It actually made the news. So if you get to be here and you get lucky enough to see one of these animals, just be really grateful for it and feel free to brag to me because I'll be happily envious for you. And there's some other animals here that we can show you as guides and tell you about that you probably haven't heard of, but that are really fascinating and fun to watch. And a lot of them have really interesting ecological roles and, and circumstances going on. So this bird here, this is a trumpeter swan. These birds are incredible survivors and they're going through a major recovery process. Yellowstone's got all of the native species that were here prior to 1800 and not many that weren't. So that's quite unique. But one of the animals that was introduced is the lake trout. And you wouldn't think that trout would have much impact on swans, but that is a whole complicated food web story. And so there's some restoration efforts going on with trumpeter swans. They're quite rare here. This is a disjunct population of swans. And if you come on one of our trips, we can explain that whole crazy, complicated ecological story. It's really fascinating. Another animal that you might know of might not have really thought about seeing in Yellowstone is a badger. That's the one in the lower left. They are related to wolverines and they're a lot more common. They are so fun to watch. A lot of people think they're kind of dangerous. I suppose if they were digging under your house or if you tried to hug one, they could be, but they are really a joy to behold, especially when they're in family groups. They play a lot and they're incredible diggers. And sometimes we get to see them hunting interactively with coyotes, which is really fascinating to see two different animal species working cooperatively to get something to eat. On the upper left is a pika. For those of you who are of the generation where you would know what a Pikachu is from Pokemon, that is actually based off of wild Japanese pika. And these animals are so cool to watch. They live in rock piles only at high elevation. They're quite small. They look a little bit like a chinchilla and they move really fast. So they'll jump down into beneath a rock and they'll pop out somewhere else. And they spend the whole summer collecting wildflowers and grasses and and sort of stockpiling them in what we call a hay pile. So they're always really fun to see. They're a little bit tricky to find because they blend in so well with the rocky environments. But luckily when they are frightened by something, like if a bird of prey flies over, or they have some cause for concern, they do a little alarm bark and it sounds like they're squeaking. So a lot of times that will clue us into where they might be. We're gonna talk a little bit about logistics of getting here and choosing a time of year. This is a slightly complicated graphic, but this gives you an indication of the times of year when specific animals are most viewable, most prevalent. They're on grizzlies and black bears. The red indicates that they're typically in hibernation during those months. So you can kind of get an impression of, of what you might see in any given month in Yellowstone. And then down at the bottom, we have a bit of an indication of what human crowding tends to look like. So obviously in the summer, that's peak season. There's a lot of people here. 
but it's also the best time of year to go hiking and backpacking. And the backcountry in Yellowstone is never crowded. As soon as you get more than about a half a mile away from roads, you just don't see many people at all. And once you get three or four miles away from the roads, you begin talking to anybody that you do happen to see because it's such an uncommon thing. It really does change as you get off on the trails. And we we love that time of year. You can also go snowshoeing in the wintertime and you have the place to yourself. It's really fantastic. Certain things you can see if you are here from about late April to early July is what I would call baby season in the spring. Our bison start to calve in mid-April and then by June, the elk, the bighorn sheep, and the mountain goats have all had their young as well. Of course, it's a great time of year to see baby birds. The spring's really fun. We get a lot of wildflowers. Everything is really bright green. And then as we get into August, September, and October, it's the rut season. So you'll see elk bugling in August. The bison bulls, their testosterone levels get really high and they start harassing the cows. So one bull will find one cow that he thinks is about to become receptive and he will just stick with her and harass her and bellow at her. And if she gets up to try to run away, he'll chase in front of her and try to prevent her from seeing any other bulls. And if another bull comes, he might decide to defend his opportunity with this cow until she finally reaches her 15 to 30 minute per year window where she's receptive to breeding. And then it's wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. And he's on to the next cow. So that's <laughs> really, really interesting thing to see in August. All of that going on across the valley is absolute bedlam. Interesting animal behavior, really great photography opportunities. And sometimes those bison bulls will fight quite aggressively. That tends to bring carcasses and then we get concentrations of wolves and bears on those. Winter is amazing. We get a lot of, like I mentioned, solitude, blended, beautiful landscapes. When we get snow, this hasn't been the best snow year, but I'm hoping next year is going to be a lot better. We have the fewest visitors. A lot of the roads inside of the park are closed to regular vehicles, but you can still access 50 miles of road between Gardner, Mammoth, and Cook City. And so that's where we do our winter tours, our snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, and our wildlife watching tours. It's the best time to see wolves and otters. It's actually my favorite time of year. And sometimes we get lucky enough to have really great views of wolves in the wild. We have around 100 wolves in Yellowstone, usually somewhere between eight and 10 wolf packs. And this has not always been the case. Wolves were killed off in Yellowstone by the 1920s or 1930s, depending on what source you go with. And they were reintroduced in 1995 and 1996. Many of these wolves came from Canada. So thank you, Canada, for helping us out with this restoration project. And they are really fascinating to watch because they are very social and getting to hear wolves howl is a really special thing that a lot of our visitors get very excited about and there's a whole culture around wolf watching. So a little bit about weather conditions and what you might expect here. Our weather varies dramatically all year round. In the winter, we often get sunny days, but those days tend to be really, really, really cold. And we can get temperatures down to negative 40. In some parts, some of the higher elevation parts of Yellowstone, it can get even colder than that. In the summer, again, super variable. It's common to have freezing temperatures in the morning and then to have actually quite hot afternoons where we get up to 85 or 90 degrees, especially at lower elevation. We can get thunderstorms, which come through and give us spectacular cloud displays, but also might bring us really heavy rain or hail for 15 minutes to an hour. But usually the weather is changing all the time, so it's actually quite dynamic and quite fun. Change is just a constant in Yellowstone. Every day is really unique and different. Suffice to say, bring a lot of different layers, stay hydrated. In the winter time, you're going to want to make sure that you bring a warm hat. You always, always, always want to wear your sunglasses and your sunscreen because the UV is really intense here at high elevation. Our base elevation in Yellowstone is about 5,000 feet high. Our highest mountains are kind of 11, almost 12,000 feet. So you're in that elevational range, but I earned these wrinkles mostly here. You'll want to bring clothing layers so that you can stay comfortable anywhere between zero 
and negative 40 degrees. When we're snowshoeing and cross-country skiing, we generate a lot of our own body heat. But sometimes when we're watching wildlife, we're a little bit more still. And so you need to be sure to dress in layers that'll keep you warm, even when you're not super active. Always bring your own water bottle so that you can keep that thing full and stay hydrated. You'll want to wear insulated boots with wool or synthetic socks. Cannot express to you how much warm feet make for a good day. Likewise, you'll want to wear insulated and preferably waterproof or at least water resistant trousers. Gloves are a tough one because especially if you're doing photography or if you're using a spotting scope, you'll want to be able to get to your fingers sometimes. I am ever searching for the right gloves. I tend to wear the mittens that flip over your fingers. You're going to have to find what works for you and just make sure that you really do make an effort to get the best gloves that you can. And always as a reminder, when you're in places with extreme cold, and especially if there's any dampness, our winters tend to be quite dry, but you don't want to wear cotton. If you get cotton wet, you, you get cold and you suffer. In the summertime, kind of similar story, closed shoes, preferably waterproof, especially if you're here anytime other than maybe July and August, tend to have mud and things like that that you're going to encounter. I like to wear long pants as well as long sleeve cotton shirts in the summer because we don't have terrible mosquitoes or biting flies, but we do have some and wearing loose long sleeve clothes shirts and loose pants is a way to protect ourselves from those insects without using a lot of insect repellent, which kind of isn't really necessary here, but that also keeps our aquatic invertebrates and our insect community that's so critical to keeping our ecosystem functioning and keeping our plants going from being killed by, by insect repellent. So we also recommend that you bring a fleece or wool layer because we're going to have those cold mornings and it's sort of random weather event, waterproof jackets, an absolute must have. We just keep one in our packs all the time during the summer. Gloves are a good idea again, because it can get cold. You're going to want to have lighter layers underneath in case we do have one of these really warm days where it gets up to 85 or 90 degrees. Again, hats, sunscreen, sunglasses, and water. Always drink the water. We do have a lot of surface water sources inside of Yellowstone, so you can do filtration or uh, water treatment. So you don't need to carry a lot of water at any given time if you've mapped out your water sources. Just tips to stay safe in Yellowstone. To be a respectful observer and photographer, the Park Service says you must stay 100 yards away from bears and wolves and 25 yards away from all the other wildlife. The big caveat being that if an animal changes its behavior in response to your presence, you're too close, so you need to move away. And depending on what's going on with that animal, if it has a really young baby or you're approaching a wolf den or something like that, your distances that you need to stay away can be a lot further, like we're talking a quarter of a mile. So just bear that in mind. If an animal is staring at you, especially if a bison is looking at you and raising its tail, that means you're too close. It's a bit agitated. You need to move away. Obviously never feed wildlife. Don't feed the bears. Don't feed the ravens. We have a history of feeding bears in Yellowstone. In the 1970s, the Park Service made a huge effort to stop that. And a lot of bears lost their lives as that behavior was being eliminated from the population. So we are super, super careful with our food, even our crumbs, to make sure that we don't let bears find out what human food is made of. And that is very important for protecting ourselves as well as other hikers. When you're in the backcountry, Country, you don't want to have to deal with a bear that has somehow found out what your food is because it is a bear's job to get fat in the summer and they will stop at nothing to access food sources, which will enable them to do that. So we don't want them to know about our food. Other things about bears, carry bear spray, know how to use it. We can teach you how to do that. Don't hike alone or in silence. Just general safety things around Yellowstone. Please don't stand in the road. People aren't paying attention. They will run you over. It has happened. Generally, stay on trails and boardwalks. Be gentle on the vegetation. Avoid stepping on, especially sagebrush and things that are long-lived. And if you bring a dog to Yellowstone, it's incredibly important that you keep it on a leash, you keep it close to the road, and you keep it away from other wildlife because they might attack your dog, and we just don't want that to happen. When you're driving in Yellowstone, it is quite an adventure. This can happen to you. You should expect to see wildlife on the road. The bison use the roads for efficient travel corridors. So you might come around a corner and encounter a large herd of bison or a single bull standing in the middle of the road bellowing because it's rut and that's what he's doing. So please obey the speed limits so that you don't actually end up in a, in a very unfavorable encounter with an animal. But also when you're looking at wildlife, if they're not right in front of your car and you don't have to stop because they're in the road, 
pull off on a pullout and don't stop in the road, especially around blind corners, because we do have truck traffic through Yellowstone. Stay on your side of the road at all times. Near head-on collisions are a source of stress for us guides. If you come in the winter, it's a good idea to just get a bunch of information about travel here. You'll need snow tires and you'll need to always be careful around the edges of the road because getting stuck is a thing that happens to all of us. In case you're wondering how to come and enjoy all this stuff, we have opportunities for you. We have something called a week in the wild, which is a six day, five night, all inclusive event. The dates are listed there. So we've got one coming up in May that actually still has some space in it. And then we have uh, two in August and one in September. You basically just need to fly to Bozeman or otherwise get to our area. We stay in a lodge. We go out and we have four full days where you have an option of hiking or doing a several other activities. So you kind of choose your own adventure each day. We have a group of guides who are specifically working on these trips. And there are some of the most experienced local naturalists and biologists that we know. So it's a way that you can basically come experience Yellowstone and you don't have to plan much of it on your own. We will prepare your meals for you. It includes accommodation and transportation, as well as those scopes and everything. And we also have nightly lectures from local experts. If these dates don't work for you, you have the option of booking things kind of a la carte. We do wildlife watching trips, full day hikes, geology focused hikes and tours. We do birding trips, snowshoeing and cross-country skiing in the winter, and we also do backpacking trips, but those are unfortunately booked up for 2022 at this stage. And those you can book any day of the year that we have availability. And you can book those on 57hours.com. You don't have to be super, super fit to join our trips, especially on the private trips. Those will be you and whoever you invite to come with you. And so we can adjust and modify based on how intense or how low of intensity you want to have your experience be. We help you out with all the technical gear. Your seasons are going to depend on what you want to see and how crowd tolerant or averse you are. We can accommodate most dietary restrictions and our nearest airport is in Bozeman. So there's a bunch of resources here for you all to check out if you want more information about Yellowstone or how to get here. Thank you guys for joining me. I really appreciate it. And I hope I get to share this place with you in person sometime soon.